I'm looking forward to a very productive day today. My name is Mike Zagami. I am with Miller Wenhold, and I'm here this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, State Senator Chap Peterson. Senator Peterson has been a longtime advocate for small business in the Commonwealth, and that makes sense. He's a small business owner himself, a very successful small business owner, I should say. His law firm has been ranked on U.S. News and World Report's best law firms list, and a number of the firm's associates have been named to the best lawyers in America list. Since arriving in the Virginia Senate in 2007, Senator Peterson has been a constant advocate for small business interests. He understands that small business owners do not want to spend their time and money cutting through red tape and fighting bureaucracy, and so he successfully patroned legislation, one-stop legislation, that allows business owners to register for their business license, to register for tax, and to register any vehicles all in one place. He understands that small business owners do not have unlimited access to capital, and so he has called for the end of the accelerated sales tax, which requires businesses to front their sales tax to the state each year. He understands the importance of keeping business taxes low in Virginia so that the state's small businesses aren't burdened by high payroll and high property taxes, and to ensure that Virginia continues to be one of the most small business-friendly environments in the region. And today, Senator Peterson is here to give us an update on small business in the Commonwealth. So please join me this morning in welcoming our state senator, Mr. Chap Peterson. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is a great honor to be here. And, uh, you know, it's funny. There's two things in my life that years ago I never would have thought of of being my identity. But they're the two things that, frankly, I take more seriously than anything else. One is being a father. I have four children. And the second is being a small business owner. And, again, I didn't grow up planning to be either of those. I didn't go to school planning to be either of those. I thought I'd be a politician. I thought I'd be an attorney. I thought I'd play for the Redskins. Um, <laughs> but, you know, life takes funny journeys. And uh, it's funny. When I get up in the morning, I love going to work. I love the people I work with. I love to make money. I love to be able to give people uh, bonus checks at Christmas time. And I also like to spend time with my kids and watch them grow and develop. And, and those are the two things I really enjoy in life. So. I don't know where you all feel about your kids, but I know you love your businesses, so you're here. Um, you know, I, I always believe in uh, starting a, uh, a keynote speech, or any speech that is, I, I tell them a little bit of humor. And um, I heard a speech, or I, I heard this once uh, through the grapevine. My dad was an academic, and he was a very, very smart man. And uh, this is a story that I think of when I think of this story, even though he didn't tell it to me. But there was once a professor that was a brilliant economist, a PhD, Nobel Prize nominee, or the whole nine yards. And he used to go all over the United States and he would give lectures. And he would talk about the finer points of economics and these complicated theories. And he was wonderfully celebrated. This was before the internet age, by the way. This is back a few years back. And he had a driver who took him everywhere. And, uh, this driver got to know his speech inside and out. And one day the driver said to him, he said, you know what? He said, you're really not all that much smarter than I am. He said, I bet I could give that speech the same way that you could. And the economist was intrigued by this. And he said, okay, we'll tell you what, uh, we're going to the university or whatever today. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll drive the car and you can give the speech. So the, driver put, the uh, professor put on the driver's uniform and the uh, driver sat in the back uh, in the suit, and they drove to the engagement, and the driver gets on stage, and he starts to speak, and he gives a brilliant dissertation on economic policy. And afterwards, he said, okay, I've spoken. Are there any questions? And there were all these graduate students in the room, and they all had to show how smart they were, so they started asking all these questions, and uh, the driver heard all these questions before, so he knew the answer to every question, so he answered them all flawlessly. And finally, there was this one grad student, and there's always one in every class, that had this incredibly complicated question. And it had all these different subparts to it. And the driver listened to the whole question, and he finally stopped and said, you know what, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard. And he said, that question's so stupid, my driver could answer it. <laughs> and so he brings the driver on stage, and sure enough, the, you know, his driver, that is the economist, answers it. So I, I tell that story, uh, because I'm up here speaking and I'm trying to give some expertise on small business, but in reality, you all could give my speech better than I could, and you probably have more experience than I do. So it's a humbling business, uh, both owning a business and being in politics. So I, I say that to, to begin this. Um, 
I want to talk about a couple things. Uh, I want to talk, and I'm a local guy. I'm a state and local guy. I got started as a city councilman in Fairfax. But I want, I want to start talking about the national economy, and I'm going to work backwards towards the Virginia General Assembly, talk about where we are, where we're going, and what we can do to get there. And kind of the first thing I want to talk about is where we are. You know, it was four years ago, almost to the day, and I remember this so vividly. Uh, one of my friends was getting married, one of my college friends up in Manhattan, and we were up there on the weekend. It was a brilliant fall weekend, just like this weekend will be, I'm sure. And uh, it was the same weekend that Lehman Brothers was going down. And uh, Merrill Lynch was about to go down. AIG was about to go down. And literally, the financial structure that all of us had grown up with was crumbling around us. Bear Stearns had filed a bankruptcy. I mean, investment banks that when I got out of college, you, people you interviewed with and my friends worked for and were considered the plum jobs everywhere, right and left were folding. Bank of America was in trouble. And it was a very surrealistic time because everywhere people are walking around and you pick up the Wall Street Journal and the stock market's under 10,000, then it's under 8,000, then it's down to 6,800. Uh, Congress is talking about a bailout plan. And it was literally without correlation in my lifetime. It was exactly four years ago. And of course, we had a bailout package and Congress decided, rightly or wrongly, that some banks or some businesses were, quote, too big to fail. And they went ahead and wrote the bailout package, and uh, we sort of staggered onward. And it, of course, left the question unanswered, what business has to be saved in order for this economy to be saved? Uh, large businesses certainly get the most attention. What about small businesses? I mean, if my business is about to go under, is anybody going to write us a check? The business on Main Street is about to go under, is anybody going to write that business a check? And the bottom line is I think it refocused an issue, which I know you all are going to get into today, is what does too big to fail mean, and how do we help the small business as opposed to just focus on all the large business. Now, I'm going to keep this macro for a little bit longer. After that, those few months, when we went into a recession, we had 24 months of economic contraction in this country, 24 months where our economy got smaller and smaller and smaller. It was literally unprecedented going back to the 1930s. We had a 5% decline in real gross domestic product uh, up through July of 2009. That's a 5% contraction in the economy. Now, it's not that people are leaving the country. It's not that people stopped having babies. not that our population declined. Our economy actually contracted, again, completely without precedent, uh, but for the 1930s. 45 states of the 50 contracted during this time. So nearly every single state shared uh, in what was this sacrifice and what was this turn back in our economy. There were fewer jobs in America in 2010 than there were in 2001. So I would say for a lot of people, including myself, almost all of us went through this period. Some of us may still be in this period, but we looked at it as something we survived uh, and something we adjusted to. I'll give it uh, from my own perspective. I'm a lawyer. I graduated from law school UVA in 1994. I started practicing. Uh, I joined a number of large firms. I became a partner in a national firm, uh, Bracewell and Giuliani. And then in 2005, I partnered up uh, in Fairfax City. We started our own firm, what's now uh, Servile Isaacs and Peterson. And uh, when I got out, uh, when I started my own firm, one of the first things I did was uh, started representing custom home builders and mortgage bankers because that's where the money was. Those were the great clients to have. They would pay their bills. They had a ton of business. And within 24 months, they were all out of business. And in fact, for a while, I was back in uh, doing drunk drivings and simple assaults. Because uh, you know what? I got news for you. When one client base goes away, you got to find another one. You can't just sit around waiting for uh, the construction trade to pick up again. Uh, but all of us had to adjust in our own way to what happened during that time. And I had to adjust as an attorney. Uh, in a lot of ways, we've been able to sort of recreate our business model. And, and now our law firm is twice the size that it was back in 2005. But that was a time of tremendous transition. Now, we are still, as everybody knows, in a situation where we have 8.3% unemployment approximately nationally. In Virginia, we're a little bit better. We're about 6%. We have a lot of great advantages in Virginia. Uh, one that, of course, we have uh, tremendous access to the federal government, a federal government that creates jobs, uh, both down in Hampton Roads area through the US Navy and, of course, up in Northern Virginia. And also, we have maintained pro-business policies in Virginia, which I believe has helped us create jobs. I think uh, 
there's a, a, an article in the Washington Post recently that showed that Northern Virginia had created 30,000 jobs in the past year, and during that time, Maryland had basically held even. They had created 1,000 jobs. And now we're both so close to the national capital, neither one of us was quantitatively different in terms of our population, and uh, yet we were able to bring those jobs in a lot of ways, I think, because we have strong pro-business policies in Virginia, which I'll get into in a second. Now, I've talked about the recession, I've talked about the economic contraction, and that's all negative. But I'm not a negative person. In fact, I have an associate that he was always telling me, oh my gosh, the other side just filed a motion to dismiss our case, or oh my gosh, the, someone's filed for sanctions, or oh my gosh, this client won't pay his bill. And I always say, you know what, I, I don't want to hear bad news. I said, anytime you come to me with an issue, I want you to describe the potential opportunity. Okay, so if our case got dismissed, I want you to talk about how great this appeal is going to be. Okay, if the client won't pay the bill, I want you to talk about how we're going to go meet that client and find out what the problem is. Uh, if someone filed a motion to dismiss, I'll talk about how we're going to go into court and kick their butt on that motion. Okay, so always talk about the opportunity. What has this contraction meant for opportunity? Well, I'll tell you a couple things. One is, if you're looking to lease office space, it's a great time. Okay, I mean, there's more vacancy now, and the rates are so much better now than they have been really any time in the past 20 years. If you want to hire people out of college, it's a great time. Let me tell you something. You can get qualified young people, hardworking young people, to work for your business. And I tell you, I've hired them out of college uh, who will work for, frankly, a pretty low rate. And uh, it's not to say you want to pay people what they're worth, but when you have the ability to hire somebody for maybe $10,000 less than you would have six or seven years ago, it's a good option to have, okay? Uh, so I think that there's opportunities. Now, what are the challenges that we have as business people? One is, of course, lack of demand. I think uh, as there's been less money in circulation and people lost jobs, certain businesses have suffered. Uh, certain businesses that, for example, uh, <coughs> relate to luxury items like boats and things like that, they have absolutely suffered. Cost uncertainty. One of the things I know you're going to talk about today is health care. I can tell you as a small business person, our costs for health care go up every year. Our premium costs go up every year. Now, maybe our coverage is better. I don't know. Uh, frankly, I haven't been to a doctor in years, so I, I, could, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but the bottom line is those costs go up every year. And I think one of the biggest problems we have as business people is cost uncertainty. Insurance. If you get malpractice insurance, directors and officers insurance, all of these costs, again, can add to cost uncertainty. Lack of access to capital. One of the biggest problems I think we have today, as opposed to 2005, is a lack of access to capital to small businesses. And I know I had a chance to talk to a couple bankers here beforehand that they are still making loans. I will tell you that it's a lot harder to get loans now than it was back in 2005. And of course, a lot of that had to do with mortgage-backed securities. Uh, the mortgage-backed securities came into the system, corrupted it. It was a cancer inside the system, unfortunately. And it took years to clean that cancer out. Uh, but I believe it's had an impact on uh, the ability to obtain credit. Of course, the, the fact that about 20% of our homeowners, even in Northern Virginia, are upside down in their mortgages doesn't help either. I represent people, I knock on doors all the time, of people that, you know, they're paying 7, 8, 9% on their mortgage. They would love to be able to go in and refinance, but they don't have any equity, and they don't have any collateral. And one of the challenges we've had in the General Assembly, I'll be happy to talk about this a little bit, is trying to give people that are stuck with a house that's not worth the security the ability to either write down the loan or to go back in and refinance, and so they're not paying seven or eight, nine percent, which frankly just encourages them to eventually file a bankruptcy because they can't make those payments. Um, lack of confidence. You know, one of the great things about America, how many, first of all, how many people have lived overseas? Put your hand up if you've lived overseas. You learn so much about your country when you live overseas. I was a teacher in Japan for two years after I got out of college. And to be honest, I never even thought of myself as an American. Yeah, you know, I grew up in Fairfax City, went to Fairfax High School as a Fairfax rebel. That was kind of how I thought of myself. And I went to college and got out. And suddenly I'm living in a country where nobody speaks English, at least in the town I lived in. I was the only white person. And I came to envision myself as an American. And one of the great things about Americans, because we meet each other sometimes, you know, you go to the U.S. and say, hey, that's an American, you're an American, is Americans have a sense of confidence about themselves. They have a sense of confidence about their country. It's infectious. It really is. And I think that confidence was tested three or four years ago. Now, 
some people say we're getting our confidence back. Some people say we don't. You know, that's we have a presidential debate that'll be about that, and I guess we'll find out. But I believe that there was a lack of confidence for a few years about people not having the confidence to start a business, or maybe they had an idea, but they didn't have the confidence to put their own money in, to ask other people for money to put in. Um, I believe there was a crisis of confidence. Now, I've, I've talked about some of the challenges that we have in this country. And I've, again, I've talked about some of the opportunities. And now let me boil it down at the state level. The Commonwealth of Virginia has been around a long time, about 400 years. And we've seen all kinds of challenges. You know, when they first formed the House of Burgesses, one of the biggest problems they had was getting wiped out by Indians. So, you know, the, the, the challenges change from day to day. But the bottom line is nothing we face today is more serious or more critical or more complicated, frankly, than what has been faced by previous generations. And they, previous generations were able to build a great economy, they were able to achieve civil rights, they were able to build a public education system that was, frankly, the wonder of the world. So we've proven that we can do it in Virginia. So how can we make Virginia, again, the best state for business? How can we make it a place where people, again, have confidence to invest their money? How can we make it a place where people and banks have confidence to lend money? How can we make it a place where consumers have the confidence to go ahead and uh, make a purchase, uh, buy a house with the expectation that they will be able to work for the next 25 or 30 years and pay that loan off? Well, let me start with some simple points. And I'm going to, on occasion, sort of digress. And, and I'm not here to promote myself, trust me. I mean, to be honest, I'm not looking to get any clients or anything. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the policies that we can implement at the state level to make us a better business state. One is make life easier. You know, one of the things I always tell my wife, and I got to remind myself, how do I make your life easier? Okay? If one of my associates walked in the door and said, how do I make your life easier? That's someone that's on my good side for that day. Okay? So how can we make your life easier? And the gentleman that introduced me, Paul, right? Mike, I'm sorry, see? All right. Had a good, I appreciate him bringing up the one stop because that was a chance for we could make life easier. You know, one of the hardest things about starting a new business is you got to go out and obtain all these licenses. Got to get a business license. You got to get a uh, sales tax license. You got to go out and uh, get a license for all the, the commercial vehicles that you have. So you got to go out and sort of gather up all these licenses and certificates and get started. And I had an idea, and actually it was brought to me by the uh, treasurer of Fairfax City, which is why don't we get all these licenses so you can obtain them in one place? And so instead of having to schlep out to DMV and wait in line for three hours, why not have it at your local government center where you've got to register for sales tax anyway? So we put that bill in place and we called it the one-stop one idea. So if you open a new business, you just go into the local treasurer and in counties, it'll be at the courthouse, here it'll be at the county government center, and say, I'd like a business license, I'd like to register for sales tax. Oh, and by the way, I have these uh, two or three corporate vehicles. I'd like to get titles on those and get them registered also as corporate vehicles. One place, one time. That way you're not driving all over Fairfax County. And we felt like that was a way to get, make people's lives easier. We were able to pass that bill and put that system in place. A second thing, customer-friendly permitting. You know, I represent clients all the time that go to places and they need to get permits. I mean, to do anything these days, you need to get a permit. For example, you have clients that uh, own a restaurant that serves liquor, got to get an ABC permit. Uh, they want to have dancing or music, got to get a dance permit. Uh, they want to have uh, at certain hours, they got to go and get an occupancy permit. Maybe they need a special use permit. By and large, we can go jurisdiction by jurisdiction. I've had pretty good success in Virginia. I will say this, I had a client that owned a business in a certain county across the river, and this is a gentleman that put about a half million dollars into a restaurant to fix it up, and there was a mistake on his liquor license, he was allowed to keep his business open until 2 a.m., but under the occupancy cert permit, it was only allowed to keep the, uh, the uh, premises open until 1 a.m. So it was an hour difference, and that hour was important to him because if the police came and shut him down at 1, then that was an hour of lost revenue. Now, I don't go to bars anymore. I don't go, certainly don't go to nightclubs. But that was important for him as a businessman. And so I went to the county there and I said, uh, you know, what do we have to do to get this fixed? Because it was frankly a clerical error. And I had to file for a special use permit. And to do that, I then had to go and get some emergency evacuation plan. We had to have a zoning plan done. We had to notify every community association within 35 miles. It, honestly, it was about an 18-month process. And I'm like, 
And meanwhile, my guy's going out of business. I'm like, does anybody care? I mean, does anybody notice? One of the things we need to do at the state government, the local government, is make sure the customer's not always wrong. Sometimes the customer's right. Customer-friendly permitting means when a customer comes in, making sure that person's treated like a customer. Okay, now there's not there's some permits that are gonna be wrong. There's some businesses that are gonna be wrong for a certain neighborhood. And if so, you can tell that person and give the appropriate notice to people. But just in general, having a system in place where people that need to obtain permits, for example, the ABC system, that they can do so in a, an efficient way that respects their time and their money. Keeping the business taxes low, but also uniform. This was uh, alluded to earlier, and being a low tax state is an advantage. Now, I'm a Democrat, by the way, okay? All right, so, you know, hopefully they don't want to toss me on the Democratic Party, but let me tell you something. I'm not one of these people that walks around all glum because taxes are too low, okay? The bottom line is keeping business taxes low has been a great benefit for the state. We have attracted businesses, okay? Now let me talk about the other side. Keep them uniform. There are a lot of businesses in this state that are exempted from paying taxes. For example, they're exempted from paying certain sales taxes. We have a whole uh, statute, a whole code section that exempts certain uh, businesses from paying sales tax. Okay, we have uh, uh, all sorts of tax credits, and some of them are valuable, some of them are not. But keeping taxes uniform is important because you want to make sure that everybody has a stake in the system. All right, I'm a big believer that everybody should have a stake in the system. You know, one of the things they always ask you when you're an attorney is, do you do pro bono representation? And I always say, no, I don't. I make everybody pay. Now, there's some people I make them pay 100 bucks, but everybody's got to pay something. And the reason is that they don't pay something that they don't respect your time. They don't respect the fact that you're giving them a professional service. So everybody should pay something. Now, that doesn't mean some clients, they're going to pay your full hourly charge, and some people, you're going to end up writing off 99% of it. But you want everybody to pay something. Taxation should work the same way. Same way. Everybody should pay something. And I'm a big believer in keeping taxes low means keeping them uniform, trying to eliminate loopholes, and trying to make sure that everybody has the same set of rules that they play for. And that's especially important to small businesses because you got, I got news for you. Y'all don't have lobbyists down in Richmond the way that, say, Lockheed Martin or North of Grumman or Newport News Shipbuilding. They've got lobbyists, okay? They know what they're doing. And I give them all the credit in the world. Dominion Power. You folks... People like me, we don't have that, okay? So that's one of the reasons why it's a very strong principle to me that you need to keep taxes uniform even as you keep them low. Keep business regulations simple and accessible. You know, government doesn't need to be complicated. Most people in government, myself included, are pretty simple people, okay? Laws should be written simply. One of my biggest challenges in Richmond is simply to get the legislative service people to write laws using direct sentences, subject, verb, object, okay? You don't have to say some blankety blank shall not suffer blankety blank, okay? Just write in simple sentences. Ernest Hemingway would have made a great congressman, okay? Keep things simple. The same thing with regulations. Keep regulations simple. Make them accessible. Anything that's a law or that's a regulation should be immediately available by the internet, uh, anybody, for example, a local zoning code should be available on the internet. A real estate record should be available on the internet. One of the bills that I, I passed actually, or one of the bills I actually uh, uh, sponsored years ago uh, with uh, my friend Senator Cuccinelli was actually to make our entire state budget uh, available on the internet. It was me and Ken together. It was the lion laid down with the lamb. Okay, I was the lamb. But the bottom line is in this day and age, everything should be accessible. Everything should be written in plain English. You know, lawyers are not so smart. You can use precise language and precise words and still uh, use it in a way that people understand what the law is. And when people understand what the law is, then that improves compliance. Create tools for success. You know, public schools have not always been a part of Virginia. We didn't have public schools in this state until really until the 1880s, and we didn't really have the K through 12 requirement until approximately the 1930s. Fairfax High School was not formed until 1935. That was the first full-time high school, uh, 9 through 12, in the county. And I know that because my great-grandfather was the chairman of the county school board, and my grandmother actually was one of the first students to attend. And so 
in Virginia, we've not always had compulsory public education as part of our tradition. But we have it now, and we have a great school system. I grew up in our school system. Let me tell you something. I went to Fairfax High School, graduated. I went to one of the top liberal arts college, and I was on the dean's list every semester, and I never missed a party, okay? So the bottom line is you can achieve coming out of Fairfax County Public Schools. But a great public school system is important. Access to higher education is important. You know, higher education is great, and look, I mean, we're here to George Mason today for any number of reasons. One is it educates people, it gives people opportunities. Also, it spurs economic growth. If you've ever flown over Virginia in a plane, not a big plane, but a little plane, where you can look down and see, actually see the terrain below, you'll see that there's vast stretches of agriculture, vast stretches of undeveloped property, and then you'll see these just sort of dots of vibrancy dots of vibrancy with development and, and buildings and people and vehicles and almost always there's a university in there somewhere, okay? So universities, they spur growth, they bring people, uh, they, they develop ideas, but that's an important part of developing economic uh, development. Access to technology. You know, in an earlier generation, one of the chief functions of government was to give people basic resources, water, electricity, roads, and that's still important, okay? All those things are still important. In fact, my father, who, who passed away about six months ago, was a municipal bond uh, analyst, and when I spoke at his funeral, one of the things I said was, my dad had a way of synthesizing ideas, taking the most dry and boring subject matter and making it explicable so that people could have running water, so they could have flush toilets, so that they could have clean water to bathe their children. Not just in America, but in the third world. And I said, what a legacy, what a legacy to leave. Now, in the United States, we're lucky that for the most part, we have conquered those fundamental challenges. But one of the things that we're still working on is access to technology. Let me tell you, if I see a community that doesn't have access to broadband, I'm gonna see a community that will not attract jobs, will not attract new jobs. If I see a household where, for example, a household that doesn't have access to the internet, so the child goes home and they don't have the opportunity to get on a computer and, and uh, learn about information, learn about the world. Now maybe they can go to a public library. We have a great library system here in Fairfax County. But by and large, that child's a step behind. Okay, access to technology. And technology, the government can provide that. They can help that happen in so many ways. I'll give you a great example. When Mark Warner was the governor. Uh, one of the ideas that he had that any time we repaved or renovated a highway, we ran fiber optic underneath. Because we were already taking up the right of way, why not put fiber optic in there? And making sure we made that a part of BDOT's plans in every opportunity. So we never missed an opportunity to expand broadband or expand fiber optic to every rural county in Virginia. I thought that was a great legacy. Creating commerce through transit and, and zoning. I talked earlier about customer-friendly permitting and customer-friendly zoning laws. One of the things we need to do as counties, as cities, is allow people to grow, allow people to develop, allow them to create hubs of enterprise, uh, hubs of commerce. I think finally, after about 25 years around Vienna Metro, we're seeing a critical mass of housing so that people will actually live there, walk to the metro, create mixed use. We're finally seeing that. Arlington's done just such a wonderful job around Clarendon and Courthouse and other uh, stops of creating density, allowing uh, building height, allowing places uh, where people can get out and walk and move around and live in an urban setting if that's what they choose. I had a bill years ago uh, which actually split the property rate, allowed Fairfax City to split their property rate uh, on real estate and allowed them to have a, a higher real estate property rate in some areas and lower in other areas. And the idea would be you could actually cause uh, or encourage development in some sectors and discourage it or at least be neutral in other sectors. I was never kind of able to get around some constitutional issues on that. But I do believe that you need to have flexibility in transit and zoning, uh, especially, as I said, at the local level where you can create communities and by creating communities you can create commerce. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about is leveraging your best assets. You know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And I think I told you earlier, when I was growing up, I just assumed I'd be a professional athlete. I mean, that's what I was interested in. You know, and I mean, my parents told me, you know, whatever you can, you'll do whatever you want to achieve. 
I tried. I mean, <laughs> I tried. I lifted every weight. I ran every mile. You know, I did everything I could, and yet I still kind of sputtered out at a small college level. And sometimes we're going to have strengths that are better than others. And for me, I love to talk. Okay, I know you're shocked to hear that. <laughs> but I found that when I had an opportunity to talk, and when I had an opportunity to speak and represent people, I was at my best. You know, I was not a great student in law school. I didn't get recruited by any of the large firms. In fact, I didn't get recruited by anybody. But I had a chance to get an internship with the U.S. Attorney. And I was able to sort of talk my way into a, a situation where as a third year student, I actually had a chance to try a jury case. It was a felony jury trial out in Charlottesville. And I stood up in front of that jury and I spoke. There was dead silence. And I remember thinking, this is what God intended me to do. This is what I can do. You know, I'm not a great student. I'm not here. I can't deconstruct all the theories of Jacques Derrida. I don't care. But I can explain why this guy who was found with an 18-inch sawed-off shotgun under his bed and a bag of dope is guilty. Okay? I can do that. Okay? I mean, I can figure that out. And I found that I enjoyed that. And that was a skill that I had, and eventually I was able to find other people that had that skill. We put together something called a law firm. But we all have skills, and you need to leverage those skills in order to be successful. Well, what skills do we have in Virginia? What assets do we have? Well, number one, we're right next to the federal government. I know that's, again, that's a surprise to everybody, but that's an enormous asset. One-third of all contracts that are performed by the federal government, that are issued by the federal government, go through Virginia-based firms. One-third. That means that we have a tremendous amount of subcontracts that come out of the state. Now, about 70% of those subcontracts go to out-of-state subcontractors. So we have a tremendous pool of potential commerce that we are, I'm not going to say letting go out of state because people can do what they want, but that we could capture in the state. I put in a bill last year that would actually incentivize Virginia general contractors that obtain federal contracts to try and keep those subcontracts as much as possible in Virginia especially in areas of Western Virginia and Southwest Virginia that have high unemployment rates. So if they needed back office support, if they needed tech design, if they needed you know, hourly wage workers to, to again fill some subcontract, that they'd look to Virginia first uh, before they went to West Virginia or Kentucky or wherever else they went. Now if the bill didn't make it through the first time, I'm gonna put it in again, but again, leveraging your best assets in Virginia, our federal contracting, our access to the federal government, our expertise in the federal government, that's one of our best access. Maximize your natural resources. You know, Virginia's a beautiful state. You know, you, you go all over the state, you won't find a state that has more beautiful vistas, has more beautiful women, no, I I just, it's a beautiful state. And if you go out to the mountains of Virginia and you see that the access we have to natural resources, coal, natural gas, methane gas, all of these natural resources, agricultural products, agriculture is still our number one export in Virginia. That we have a chance to leverage these and, for example, create new products and sell them into the marketplace. Which brings me to my next point. Geographic situation. You know, Virginia has a great uh, position in that we are right next to the Northeast. We're right next to the Northeastern quarter, which is, you know, over 100 million people. And we're right there. Uh, we have, you know, we're the only agricultural state really within hailing distance of the, the uh, D.C. Uh, metro area, uh, Baltimore metro area, and on up, Philadelphia. So we have the ability, we have these access to markets. We have two of the primary points of access on the East Coast, Port of Norfolk and Dulles Airport, both feed into Virginia. So we have a unique position that we can bring in people. We also have that here in Fairfax. You know, one of the things that we, we can do here in Fairfax is use our human capital. We have an international community in Fairfax County that's really unparalleled in the history of civilization. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I want you to, I'm going to give you a homework project. When you get home, Google National Merit Semifinalists Fairfax County. And you'll pull up a list of names. That list of names is going to blow your mind. Okay? Because those names are from all over. They're from Armenia. They're from Bangladesh. They're from South Korea. They're from China. They're from the Middle East. They're from Nigeria. They're from America. But the, the talented people that have come to this state, that have come to Northern Virginia, to educate themselves, to educate their children, to work, is unparalleled. And one of the things that's done is that has given us a unique connection 
to some of these countries these people have come from. In my case, my wife is Korean. She was born in Korea, now she's American. But we started in George Mason, we've established a branch campus in Incheon, Korea. Among other things, we have a tremendous number of Koreans that come to George Mason to be educated. That's a chance for us to start a sister campus there that's partially funded by their government because it'll be an all English university, which they want, which by the way, will be uh, a, a one and a half hour flight from Tokyo one direction and Beijing the other direction. You want to talk about being right in the middle of where the world is growing? And we can do that because in Northern Virginia, we have that access, we have those contact points. So the last point I would make about what we can do in Virginia is maximize your human capital. Use the skills that God gave you to build the business, to build the state, to build the government that can best serve your citizens. You know, the last point I'm gonna make is, is probably obvious and that's why I'm gonna make it last, and that is stay out of the way. You know, sometimes as a parent, you want to see your kids succeed. And sometimes, as a government, you want to see everyone succeed, okay? You want to. You know, I, I had a, a daughter, my daughter tried out for a soccer team and, and she was on the field and she was trying so hard and I was so proud of her. But she didn't make the team and the coach made the right choice. And you know what, it's, it's hard. You want to run out there and be like, oh, come on, can't you just put one more on the team, you know, even if you don't play. Sometimes you just got to stay out of the way and let situations develop. And frankly, we all know it's the case, that's the same way in business. Not every business is gonna succeed. You know, I, I'm very proud of my business. I'm proud of what I've done. I can't tell you how many unsuccessful cases I've had. You know, I, I, to my knowledge, I am the only attorney who gave up a seven-figure verdict before the age of 30, okay? That's not easy, okay? I mean, I've, I've gone upside down. I uh, lost numerous elections. I lost, my, uh, I lost a lieutenant governor race back in, when I was 35. And lots of times I've looked at my career and people say, well, how are you able to achieve so much? And I said, because I failed so much. And a lot of times business is the same way. And in government, you've got to sometimes step back and let people fail. Now that's, like I said, we chose four years ago not to let certain banks fail. The president chose not to let General Motors fail. And these are choices that, again, we make as public servants and the voters will have the final say as to whether or not we make the right choice. But I will say in my final point as to how we create success in the state, sometimes you have to stay out of the way. So listen, that's really the remarks I had. Um, you know, my mom wanted me to be a preacher, but uh, you know, I just didn't have it in me to talk for 45 minutes. And so, uh, you know, I'm happy to take questions if you all have them. Uh, as I said, I'm just one little Democratic senator from Fairfax County, but uh, it's a great honor to represent this community. I can't think of a greater honor. And um, I will tell you, I love being in business. And I think of that final line. How many folks have watched Jerry Maguire, the movie? You remember what that guy said, Jerry's mentor, at his last words at the end of the movie? I love my life, and I love my wife. And my friend, I wish you my kind of success. I'm happy to take questions. Anything you think we ought to be doing in Richmond we're not doing right now? Uh, I mean, heckles, questions, whatever. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, he wasn't going to give himself a plug, but I will. Uh, we're very lucky in Fairfax County, but uh, everybody throughout the Commonwealth is very lucky to have him as a state senator. Uh, I've gotten to know him over the last several years, and I can tell you, um, a man who, what he set up here today, he truly believes a very strong small business advocate. So I want to thank you, Senator, for everything that you're doing for all of us.